And so I want to tell you a little bit what it's like to work there. This is San Clemente. You can see it's mountainous. There's the peak, peak of the San Clemente at 20, 24 meters. There's an ancillary mountain here at about 1,400 meters. Mountainous. This is all virgin rainforest. There are parts of this island where no human being has ever set foot because it's dangerous. There's full of cobras and ravines. And the edge is cut off and turned into plantations. Okay. Um, there's the mountain. Okay, so at sea level, this is what it looks like. There's, is there an Navy person here at all? I think I've been stiff. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit darker, so you can see this. Anyway, beautiful beaches, no tourists, because nobody wants to come to San Jose. There's no tourist facilities, except for birders, because there are 21 endurance species of birds. Anyway, that's what it looks like. Um, oh, okay. That's a little bit darker. <laughs> Can we uh, have a moment? Hello? <laughs> It's not so easy, really, especially for a sedentary lab biologist. Um, you have to take a jeep to 1,100 meters or so and then climb up. It takes a very part of the day, which is not really so bad, even though there's stretches like this. But it's worse when you're carrying all the fly equipment, the microscopes, the ether, um, all the food and water, and 50 pounds of rotten bananas, which is really the worst. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. And you're rewarded at the top of this amazing view down the sea. Now you forget when you're working on the island that it is volcanic, um, but you are reminded sometimes when you see this road cut, these are basaltic columns. As I said, it's about 12 to 14 million years old, and it may have been submerged since then. But this shows, without a doubt, that this is a volcanic island, and it is an endemic island. It's famous for its endemic plants and animals. It has 21 endemic species of birds, which are above ripples. And this has exactly the same number of endemics as the entire Galapagos archipelago has. This is the most famous, the giant sunbird. Antoronia Fomensis, there's also a little sunbird. And if you're a botanist, there's a giant pavilion there, which excites great interest among the botanists there. Um, the Portuguese, this island was uncolonized until the Portuguese settled it in the 16th century. Uh, they settled it and they brought over a lot of black slaves from Western Africa, um, built these plantation houses called Rosas, coffee plantations, cocoa, and banana plantations. The result is that the island now is populated entirely by blacks who speak Portuguese. That's the lingua franca there. Um, and they don't have Portuguese names. Our guide is named Lucio Montero, Primo Montero. So you have to learn a little Portuguese to go there, which is very odd, um, actually. Downtown San Tomé, there's not much to it. Um, that's the biggest building in the whole country. It's about five stories, and that's it, pretty much. Um, it's one of the poorest countries in Africa. It is a democracy, one of the few real democracies in Africa, but it's also one of the poorest countries. Average income is $320 a year. Um, this is more typical of where the people live. Um, and they make their living by either working in the plantations or selling fish. For, there's a lot of them fishermen. This is the fish market. And, um, and so you say to make selling plantain chips. And um, there's a woman collecting a non endemic giant land stands for food. I mean, can you actually see these things? Yeah. So, well, uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, Anyway, so working conditions are a bit dire up there. Not only the fact that you have to work the microscope with something holding a flashlight to sort out the flies, but also because you have to live on spaghetti and sardines for a week, three meals a day. Um, because that's what the guys like, and you eat what the guys like. Um, you're rewarded at the end because the island is surrounded by wonderful fishing grass and seafood. This is Ani Gopart, my postdoc, and Daniel Lachez, who actually discovered the species is on his birthday as part of the end of our trip. So, okay, let's leave it like that. That's good. Okay, so that's the travel log. That's what it's like to work there. If you're a birder or a botanist, it's a great place to go. We don't expect like a lot of tourist amenities. So back to the science, um, because I want to talk mostly about these two species of flies. There's off the San Jose, the island in Denmark, and there's off the Yacuba, it's mainland relative, also found in the island. If you look at the flies, you see immediately that you can tell them apart. I mean, there's this very dramatic morphological difference, which is the pigmentation. If you've worked on yourself on Melanogaster, you know that the males and females have black butts, males have dark black butts, the females have bad. There's also San Tomé on the other hand, it's completely unpigmented. So it's instantly recognizable and separable, separable not only from this species, but every other species in the group. The adaptive significance of this difference, we have no freaking idea. 
But it's there, and it's the way we thought the flies apart. Um, and if you look at the, all the flies in the group, these are all nine species in the Malayagastric subgroup. You can see that this is the outlier. It is the only unpicked nine species in the group. So obviously this is a derived condition. It's something that's evolved. We have evidence that I'll tell you about later that it's evolved by natural selection. It's not just the result of genetic drift or some accident, but more on that in a sec. Um, other morphological differences, as is usual, or as is common in insects, the one other diagnostic character of these species is the male genitalia. This is the sort of clasping organ of the males. This is Drosophila acuba, Drosophila centimeter here. You can see it actually they're quite different. These are the only two characters, the pigmentation of this, that you can use to tell the species apart. Um, and so uh, most of the species in this group are pretty morphologically identical. So they're separated by some morphological differences. More important if you're interested in speciation forms of reproductive isolation. And in fact, there are lots and lots of reproductive barriers between these species. I've classified them into the three classical groups. Pre-mating, pre pre sorry, pre isolation, um, before, things that happen to keep the species apart are the genes from flowing between them before mating, strong sexual isolation. There's also ecological differences, differences in temperature tolerance and preference that are reflected, as I'll show you, in that altitudinal distribution, which causes the inviability of immigrants that will go down below from the top. So-called post-mating uh, but pre-zygotic isolation barriers that act after mating but before the zygote is formed. Um, females that mate with the wrong male, the other species, they die very quickly. The sperm is like almost toxic to them. We're not quite sure how that happens. If a female is inseminated by two males a conspecific and heterospecific, she produces almost only conspecific offspring. So that's conspecific sperm precedence. I'm not going to go through all these. Just notice that the list is long. I think we've made a list of about 20 barriers to gene flow. And then post-zygotic isolation, various gene flow occurring after fertilization. Um, there's a fair number of these, but the most important one is the sterility of the hybrids. When you cross these two species together in either direction, the males are sterile. The females are perfectly fertile, but the males are sterile. That is called Holden's rule when the heterogeneous sex is preferentially affected. So that's the background. I just want to talk a little bit about, this is going to be crudely to many people, a lot of people, the sort of genetic analysis that of some of the character differences and reproductive barriers between these species. What we do is basically old-fashioned QTL mapping, and I bet there's nobody in this room that doesn't know what that is, so I'm not going to describe it in great detail, but I'll just give you a brief crazy of how it works. It involves um, producing back cross flies that have a variety of, of genes from the two different species, and then correlating that genetic constitution, which you assess molecularly, with phenotypic characters or reproductive barriers in each of those flies. So for each fly, we have to know something about its genetic constitution and something about either its morphology or its reproductive behavior. So we make F1 hybrids between the species. They have four chromosomes, two metacentric autosomes, and telocentric X and a fourth. So here's the F1 female with the blues being sent to many chromosomes, the red being the cubas. We make those F1 females. We can't make F2s because the F1 males are sterile, so we have to back cross them. In this case, the Santomaya. Recombination and segregation in these hybrid females produces these back cross individuals. These are males having a variety of genes from the two species. Okay. And how do we know which genes they have from the two species? And this is where molecular analysis is coming. We used to use morphological mutants to do this, which are limited to like four or five mutations before the fly gets so many mutations. It's not viable anymore. Now we can use molecular markers to do this to change the type of flies. Oh, sorry, just to say that we. We do use large sample slices in these back cross analyses, about 1,500 plus, to try to prevent artifacts of false peaks in the key tail analysis. Um, the, for our first analysis, which is just basically the pigmentation differences, we use 32 PTL markers as single nucleotide polymorphism spread throughout the genome, all four chromosomes to speak. So we can find, at least roughly, the genetic constitution of a fly by looking at which genes it had. Whether, and these are species specific differences in each of these loci. So by looking at a single nucleotide polymorphism in a given region, we can say that region came from San Antonio or it came from Utah. So we can tell the genetic admixture of each individual. Okay. So the first thing we wanted to work on, simply because it's there, and again, we have no adaptive knowledge of this, but we have no knowledge of the adaptive significance of this pigmentation difference, but it's so obvious. It just begs to be analyzed. I'm not the only person that's done this. Sean Carroll's lab has been working on this in extensive. Um, but the results are quite interesting, actually. 
Um, the first thing you do, I want to show you again what the pigmentation difference looks like. This is Drosophila saccharinae, males and females. You see they're just yellow, there's no black melanin pigment. Drosophila yacuba, males are dark, black blacks, females are stripy. If you make the F1 hybrids between these two species, there's two ways you can do it, the two reciprocal crosses. Um, with the Santa mother or the Yucuba mother. And the females from these two crosses are genetically identical. And they only differ in cytoplasm and mitochondria. And you can see that morphologically they're intermediate. I hope you can see that. This is the best projection. They're sort of half straight. And there are, if you measure the pigmentation of human statistics, which we do as a of the laboratory, you see that these things are genetically identical, are morphologically identical. However, with the males, it's different. The two reciprocal males look quite different from one another. In particular, the, the male whose mother is, comes from the dark species has a dark butt, almost identical to um, the piranha species itself. The species whose mother comes from central male has a light butt. So you see that there's this huge difference in pigmentation between the reciprocal F1 males. If you're a geneticist that instantly tells you something about the genetic basis this character is, is located on the X chromosome, a lot of it. This difference is entirely caused by differences in the chromosome, because that's the only chromosome that differs between these two maps. So even before you do a back cross or a QTO map, you know what you're going to find, that there's strong linkage of pigmentation to the X. Okay. And sure enough, when you do that, and most of you, oh geez, uh, most of you have seen QTO maps, if you haven't done them yourself, you see you just run along the chromosomes. This is the entire genome, starting from the X chromosome, second and third. Uh, we don't have the fourth here, but there's no G. A P corresponds to regions of the genome where there are regions that make species-specific differences in pigmentation. So each time you see a peak, you know that there's a gene there that whether it comes from Santa Maria or Yucuba in that region affects the pigmentation of the fly. Again, you do this by correlating the pigmentation of each fly, which we measure blindly. Um, we'll measure under using blind scoring um, with the knowledge of the We don't measure them. And so the, you can see right off the bat that there's three peaks. The blues are the males, the pinks are the females, and they, they're pretty much coincident between the sexes, although there's a bigger X effect for males than females. This shows you that, first of all, there's at least three genes involved in this difference, probably more, but at least three, and that the genes that make the, the females different in pigmentation are the same genes, almost undoubtedly, that make the males different. Okay, that's no surprise. Uh, back across to the other species, for example, Santa Maria, you get exactly the same peaks in the same direction. So. We have some sort of well-demarcated regions that affect this trait, and um, they affect males and females pretty much the same. Okay. Now, because there's three peaks, I mean, in the early days, people said, well, there must be three genes. We know now that since there's you know, 12,000 genes in Drosophila, that each of these peaks can contain a number of different genes. In fact, my student, Daniel Matite, has um, done um, deletion mapping of this region using crosses between Santa and Drosophila melanogaster using a deletion kit. And we now know that that excellent peak, we have at least four genes. We've identified them all now using mutant markers, etc. And then in total, these three peaks um, comprise at least 14 different loci affecting pigmentation. Okay. So there's 14 genes. 11 of those are in the direction that you would expect if natural selection operated, i.e. in the Santa Maria regions make you light, the Yucuba regions make you dark. So this 11 out of 14 statistic, which I guess you can call the Orr statistic, because he's the one that Develop this methodology it shows you that this is probably due to natural selection. You're not going to get an 11 to 3 ratio of genes going one way or the other way if it's random group. So, probably this character is, has changed by natural selection. Um, if you're a naive pan selectionist, you would say, well, yeah, it must have because it's different. But at least <laughs> the genetic data subsumes and the genetic data supports that. Again, we have no idea of what the selective forces are or even whether they have anything to do with pigmentation at all. All we know is that these genes themselves seem to have well, under natural selection. Okay. And so now, um, and we have the data, we have 14 genes that we think comprise the totality of genes responsible for these differences, and hopefully it will be impressed, and you know, that's data about that. Um, the, the stuff that I've done, most of my work on in my life, and also Alan, I believe it, some of this is just been the genetic basis of a real reproductive barrier, which is hybrid sterility. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what are the genes that are responsible for that? We don't know what they are, but we know where they are. Here's a cross between the two species. Um, this, these bars signify X chromosomes or Ys. That little one is a Y. These are the autosomes. You cross the two species together. You get male and female hybrids. The males are sterile. 